listening to the Hazard Ground Podcast with service members from across the military sharing their stories of combat and survival. And now, here's your host, Mark Zeno. Welcome to the Hazard Ground Podcast. Once again, thank you for joining us. Another great episode coming up this week. Before we get to that, I want to remind you guys, if you know anybody who has a great story to tell, any military member or former military member with a story you think that would be a great addition to the many amazing stories we've told here on the Hazard Ground, send us an email at producer at hazardground.com. Again, producer at hazardground.com. And we can connect and try to get your story told here on the Hazard Ground. Reminder, follow us on all the social media sites, Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Keep up with the show, everything that we have going on, as well as future guests and events that are happening here with the Hazard Ground. Finally, again, our sponsorship with Amazon. We've been telling you about it every week because it's been going so, so well. Go to our website, hazardground.com. Click on the Amazon banner right there in the middle of our homepage. Do all your normal Amazon shopping as you would. We'll get a percentage of what you spend, and we'll donate it right back to some of the amazing charities you've heard right here on the hazard ground so make sure you guys help us out with that keep the ratings and the reviews coming as well love to hear from you guys love to know what you like and don't like about the show and with all that out of the way let's get on to this week's episode joining us this week is a former navy seal who had multiple deployments to iraq overseas he currently is an author a public speaker and works with a charity called hunting for healing which enriches in veterans lives by taking them hunting fishing etc he is kevin lace joining us on the hazard ground podcast kevin and welcome. Thank you for joining me. Mark, great to be here, man. Very interesting story. One thing I left out in the intro, uh, because I didn't want to kind of, you know, take away from all of your accomplishments, but uh, you actually deployed with uh, maybe one of the more famous Navy SEALs that everybody knows, American sniper Chris Kyle. So uh, you were there for a lot of what he went through and everything else. And well, that's not you know germane to who you are and what you have done. Just a, a worthwhile note, and obviously something that you know you and I have talked offline. That, that that's you know something that's certainly personal and special to you. Yeah, no doubt, man. Uh, Chris Kyle is definitely more of a household name than Kevin Lace for sure. Um, and yeah, you know, I knew Chris back when he was just Chris. Uh, we got the <laughs> Seal Team Three together, and you know, he was simply Tex back then. He was a he was a kid from Texas. I could shoot, and um, yeah, our friendship grew. We deployed a couple times, and. Um, he and I got to work together in his company, Craft, after the Navy. So we definitely had a great relationship, and uh, he went on to do great things. You were also a platoon sniper, a breacher, and a combat medic. So you've obviously accomplished a lot in your military career. But go back to the beginning and how you got into the Navy. Yeah, so it was kind of a, a circuitous route. You know, I didn't. I'm from Connecticut. You know, not too many people join the military from Connecticut. If you join the military in Connecticut, it's kind of like one of those. Uh, what happened to that guy? What, what went wrong? <laughs> that kind of, you know, you know, not everybody in New England, but from the town I was in, that's kind of how it was. So you know, I grew up your basic middle class family, um, wanted to go to college, wanted to become a doctor, went to James Madison University in uh, 2000. Um, after one semester, had a spectacular 0.7 GPA, which kind of solidified I wasn't going to be a, a, wasn't going to be a doctor in the in the near future, uh, but. The the uh, you know the attacks of nine eleven changed my direction. I, I I you know got back home, thought about what I was going to do, and made the decision to join the Navy. Uh, I had a good friend of mine whose father was killed in the Trade Center, and it really um, galvanized my decision to do something above and beyond the little uh, the little world I was living in. And the, the Navy was it for me. I wanted to become a Marine, walked to the office, uh, and they were closed. So I walked in the Navy office, saw a poster on a wall, and that was it. It was a simple decision, time to join the Navy, and set my size of becoming a team guy, being a SEAL. No, when the poster was a Navy SEAL poster? There was a Navy SEAL, yeah. It was okay. one of those old school, you know, sea, air, and land, a bunch of guys crawling out of the water with, like, handlebar mustaches, like old M16 and 203 launchers. And you're definitely outdated because back then, you know, the teams weren't, uh, you know, promoting as much as they are now. So, you know, it was an old school poster and it looked pretty cool. And I'd see Charlie Sheen's Navy SEALs and GI Jane. I was like, shit, if I can go to Bud's with Debbie Moore, sign me up. <laughs> Smart thinking. Uh, little did you know at that point in time. But um, so what did your parents say when you told them you were doing this? Well, you know, it kind of went over like a turd in a punch bowl. Um, you know, my parents were, uh, were, you know, they've always supported the military. I had grandparents in the military, um, but they felt like, I was kind of setting the bar low by joining the military, you know, going to college, you know, get, get an MD, going that route was, was where they saw me going 
where I saw myself going was totally different. Um, but they were supportive. And once they understood the path that I had chosen, it really hit home when they came to my buds graduation in, in 03. And they saw, you know, like what the teams really were. Cause I didn't, I didn't talk about the teams and buds and all that stuff. I was just like, Hey, I'm going to this training. I would like to be a Navy SEAL. And they were like, cool, great. You know, SEAL, that sounds great. But they didn't understand until they actually got out there. And, and since then, they've been, you know, wholeheartedly supportive. So when you told them you were going into the Navy, you didn't mention Navy SEALs at the time. I did. I did. But still, you know, like I said, you know, Mark, back then, it, it there was wasn't different, a lot yeah. of information out there. You know, I mean, the only thing that I had about BUDS was a warning order um, that I found online. It was like, hey, you have to do X amount of push-ups, sit-ups, run and swim times. But there wasn't there weren't very many classes out there to get you ready. And so the information was, uh, was kind of bare. So when you enlist at that point, you didn't have you, you, now you can enlist with a buds contract. You didn't do that back then. Correct. I had a buds guarantee back then. Oh, you, you could, did. Um, yeah, I did. So I, I joined as a, as a corpsman. So I signed a six year enlistment, um, that with the buds, uh, guarantee that I would be able to try out for buds at boot camp, uh, which was simply doing the PRT test. But there was no like guarantee like I was going to go to Buzz. I had to pass there and then I would, you know, go to A school, which was Corman school for me, basic medic, and then go to Buzz. All right. So you knew you were doing this the whole time. Um, were you a guy who was physically fit? Were you worried about the physical rigors of Buzz? Yeah, I mean, you know, kind of what um what made me work harder was the runs. You know, I'm I'm dangerous at short distances. I'm a sprinter, not a long distance dude. I can swim. I swam in high school, but it was the uh, you know it was the long runs in the sand that kind of made me uh, you know brought me back down to reality because I was like swimming, all the other stuff being hard, I can do that. But the runs, you know, the runs suck. When you're six three, two twenty, two twenty five, you know, soft sand sucks. Yeah, can't relate. Six three, two twenty five, never been my problem. Um, okay, so <laughs> as I, re- you- I, 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 you know, what good good things can happen. You know, what I mean, I can reach stuff on the top shelf. Yeah, and your first one to know when it rains. I get it. Um, mm-hmm. But anyway, so. You're going through buds. Uh, just real quick, you know that whole experience. What was it for you, and what stands out about buds now that you look back on it? Yeah, you know the the same things that I said back then. It's the most fun you never want to have again. Um, mm-hmm. You know, I I had a back injury at the end of uh, first phase, going into second phase, um, which got me rolled from class two forty five to class two forty six, which turned out to be a blessing in disguise. But you know, it it was tough. Buds buds sucked. Um, you know, when I injured my back, herniated disc, it, it really sucked. And just to see, you know, your, your, your dreams kind of evaporate as the class moves on and you get rolled back. You know, that was probably one of the harder things I dealt with there, but you know, the runs, the swims, the cold, it's, it's stuff that sticks with you, uh, to this day, but I can tell you it sucked. Anything in particular, any memory that is kind of galvanized, whether it be a run or, you know, a, a guy ringing the bell or anything like that? Yeah, I've got two of them. Uh, two of them came from Hell Week because what you know, there's always the statistics. If you make it through Hell Week, you have a you know seventy two whatever percent chance of, of graduating buds, and if you pass pool comp, it you know exponentially jumps up into the high eighties, nineties. Um, I have two memories. One, both of them for Hell Week. Uh, I was in Hell Week with two forty five. It was Tuesday night, so it was really at that you know tipping point. If you make it through that night, you know so and so you're you're gonna you're gonna finish Hell Week. But we had just uh, we just set up camp surf um, out there on the beach. You know, we we pitched our tents uh, with the boats, and you know the rain was there. It was it was April, April thirteenth to the fifteenth, two thousand and three, and it was hailing out on the beach in San Diego. It was cold. Oh man, um, yeah, it was miserable. And I'm and I remember I was at the 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 worst point I had been ever. You know, I'm freezing cold. We had just done some elephant walk from the uh, from the elephant cages, and it was like eight miles. We set up cold, you know, rainy, hail, sleet, all that stuff. And we're sitting there and they give us MREs. And I opened up this green MRE, MRE, you know, no heaters, of course. And I started to eat cold jambalaya. And I hate jambalaya mm. up until now. And one of my instructors, Dale, Dale Ford, who actually became my platoon chief, uh, my sister platoon chief at Team 3, gets up there and just starts pouring sand in it from a shovel on my head, landing in the jambalaya, and that's all I had. And at the moment, I realized, this is it. This is rock bottom. And it stuck with me this day. It was like the, the coldest, the most miserable I've ever been. Um, but the guy that pissed me off the most was the guy I ended up going to combat with in 06. So everything came full circle. But the other one was also in, 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 uh, in hell week. And it was how quickly people were quitting in succession. And for me, that kind of reinforced 
my will to be there. I watched, you know, people that I looked at and said, well, that person looks like they could be a seal. And they just kept quitting and quitting and quitting. And every time they quit, I felt stronger. And for me that, you know, that's something that's carried on as, as I go on now and I see people fall the wayside when we do tasks, you know, it just makes me stronger and more confident. I always ask SEALs about it, and I think you and I have talked about it before, you know, the human condition of what it does to different people when they hear that bell ring. And for those non-military, at Bud's, there's a bell you can drop on request, ring the bell, they send you home and say, thanks for coming out. And you go back to doing whatever you did in the Navy or whatever you were doing in the military at the time. And, you know, most guys, most SEALs have said, look, you know, it made me feel stronger. But, you know, it's also one of those things where it's just a constant reminder that, uh, when you look at guys, you know, the, the old book, don't, don't judge a book by its cover adage holds true because a lot of those guys look like they can hack it, but really they can't. Yeah. And, and I think it maybe it's maturity. You know, I graduated, like I said, in, in 2003 back then it, it was a, it was, is a, is a measuring contest. You know, I, I, I'm still here. They're not, I'm stronger. And I, I look back now a little more nostalgic and I don't see it as a, uh, you know, I'm physically or mentally stronger. Cause I know guys that have quit and have gone on to be very successful, make way more money than a lot of us. Um, and, and I think it's, uh, it's an honorable thing. Even if you decide it's not for you, being a seal, isn't the Zenith of life. Um, you know, for some people it is for others, it's not. Um, and I think it's, uh, it, it, it made me appreciate the people who actually came out and tried and said, I'm going to give this, you know, a test to see if I can do it. Um, for me, it was for me and I was there for those, some, you know, weren't meant to be there and they went on to do great things. So I look back and say, you know, I still appreciate the people who went out there and tried it. All right. So you complete buds at class 246, as you said, uh, but before you end up getting to a SEAL team, you end up going to the 18 Delta Special Operations Combat Medic School at Fort Bragg. Now, I was fortunate enough to deploy with uh, some special ops guys and, and attached a group, and I know what these 18 Deltas are capable of and what they had to go through. Uh, just give some of the audience some background of how tough that course really is, because in reality, correct me if I'm wrong, you're one of the few people on the earth at that point who is authorized to perform surgery without a medical degree. Correct. Yeah. So, um, you know, minor surgical techniques. Uh, so, so basically this, the SOCOM course, special operations combat medic course takes, you know, SEAL medics or Navy corpsmen. Um, back then it was force recon medics, which are Navy corpsmen, you know, army, uh, you know, uh, SF teams, ranger medics, you know, and put them through a, a, a tactical medicine course where you take a basic baseline medic and you turn them into a combat, you know, special operations paramedic. So, you know, guys who could barely, you know, hook up the O2 and put on a mask. And now you're asking to be able to do, you know, crikes where they're going ahead, inserting surgical airways into the battlefield. If there's no, you know, oral airway, you know, patent. Um, so you're learning to deal with so many different things from gunshot wounds to burns to motor vehicle accidents. Um, and then learning how to sustain patients, you know, in the absence of an immediate Kazovac or extraction platform, um, and it's a, it's a very, it, it, there's a lot of responsibility that goes to it. It's not like I've been to some courses that are just, you know, they're kind of like, yeah, hey, all right. But, you know, being a medic, they really, in the army instructors were very good at driving that home. And a lot of guys were guys who recently deployed, you know, um, to Afghanistan after 9-11 who were on the front lines and didn't have quick cas back. And they're like, you could be sitting on patients for, you know, days, days. And, and, and that, really, you know, rang home for me. It was like, you know, there's, there's a responsibility here and they did a fantastic job of taking us Neanderthals and turning us into, you know, high speed medics. Is it true? And I heard this, I, I don't know if they still do it. Maybe you can verify it, but they take like an animal that's about to be euthanized anyway. Uh, and you have to sustain its life for X number of hours, whatever, what, you know, they'll shoot it in the leg, stop the bleeding, you know, they'll, they'll stab it and cut it open. You have to stop the bleeding there, stuff like that. I mean, that, it, it's that intense, correct? Yeah. So, so the course is great at, at taking a training application and, and making it as realistic as possible. Like, you know, in the teams, we do the same thing. We push the envelope as much as possible in training to prepare for war. Um, same thing at 18 Delta, you know, we, we train with live tissue, and then, you know, the next step was going to the hospital settings, working in the trauma centers. I went to Shands in Jacksonville. Um, guys go to, you know, Tampa General. And you're working there, you know, on board with EMS to the e ER and then working up into the surgical ward. So, wow. you, know, you know, the live tissue component is important to take the models that you're working with, you know, the mannequins, go into live tissue and then eventually go into the, uh, to the uh, surgical centers and then eventually get into combat where it's just you. 
I don't want to fast forward too much, but how much of what you learned at that school actually you had to apply in combat? Uh, yeah, a fair amount, a fair amount. And, and I think probably the most important thing is when I finished up the Navy, went to PA school, physician assistant school, it came in huge. Um, you know, I had skill sets that, you know, put me above and beyond my peers sure. because I had done this in training and then I did it in combat. And now I was doing it for my master's degree. All right. So, uh, after you finish the, uh, the combat medic school, the special ops combat medic school, you finally get to your team. Uh, you, I know you said a moment ago that being a SEAL isn't the, you know, apex of life, but what was it like when you first get to the team and what were you thinking and feeling and knowing how quickly you were going to end up deploying? Uh, it was the apex of life. <laughs> you know, for me, that was it. And I said, not, you know, it's not for everybody. You know, not everybody's supposed to be a SEAL. Uh, you know, there's a lot of people want to be, you know, a select few are. Um, but for me, it was, you know, it was kind of like, you know, it's like the uh, that old scene in the program with Latimer. You know, what I mean, starting defense, place at the table. Oh, like yeah. I, I felt like I was there. You know, I finally got a place at the table. And then you realize you're just a you know a stupid new guy. You need to shut up and keep your mouth shut and like write stuff down. But for me, it was you know it, it was reaffirming that I I'd, I'd made the entrance grades to get there, and now it's time to actually create a reputation. Um, and when you walk through the quarter deck, and a lot's changed at SEAL Team 3 since, you know, we got there in 2004, 2005. Um, shoot, I, I, I'll go back and, you know, you've got Mark Lee's gear there, Ryan Joe, Mike Monsoor, guys that I walked through the door with as new guys. Um, but it, it, it just shows you. And back then, I mean, there were photos from Afghanistan right after 9-11. But a lot of badass dudes had gotten to Team 3, and it, it, it made me want to work harder and be, you know, uh, an acceptable member of that team. Now, the guys you just mentioned, Mark Lee, Ryan Job, Mikey Monsoor, they were all killed in action, correct? Correct, yep. Yeah. Uh, well, uh, Ryan Job was hit in 2006, um, and he sustained from his injuries a couple years later. Okay. Um, so when you find out you're deploying, you end up knowing you're going to Iraq. As much as you could talk about, what was the mission there? What were you supposed to be doing? Where were you going? And you know, uh, was it everything kind of you expected it to be when you finally got called up to the big leagues? Yeah, so you know, it was a it was a more condensed workup cycle than most. Um, you know, we started in uh, 05, You know, deployed in April '06. Um, you know, it's so about a year and a half or so with ProDev and all that. You know, just going to different schools. I, I went to shoot. I went to free free fall school. Um, I went to sniper school. So I got a lot of different skill sets that a lot of new guys at that time didn't get. So deploying to Iraq was kind of fit in nicely. You know, I was a medic and I was also a sniper. Um, and we had trained all throughout workup to go to Baghdad and just do direct action, direct action missions and, and, and uh, in and around BIOP, uh, Baghdad International Airport. Um, but very shortly before we left, we were given a new objective to go out west and work in marine battle space uh, <clears throat> and really implement the, you know, um, tribal engagement model, um, hearts and minds, you know, working with conventionals. Foreign to- internal defense. Born in internal defense yeah. um, to create more of a perimeter around an area like Ramadi, and then slowly, slowly chip away through successive, you know, combat outposts and fobs, um, and, and establish a presence in there. So our mission changed a little bit, but it, it, it lent a lot of credit to um, one the directive from guys like General Petraeus, who you know articulated exactly what we were going to be doing, down to our commanding officer, you know, Colin Green over at SEAL Team Three, saying. This is what you're going to do to our master chief, Mark Presson, saying this is how you guys are going to go ahead and do it um, down to the platoon level. So we knew exactly what we had to do. And in a short amount of time, we took a previous mission set of going to Baghdad and changed it into the tribal engagement out west. And it worked out great. You know, you got there uh, in April of six, just as I left. And, you know, the height of the violence prior to the surge was right then, you know, 05 into 06 when. Uh, in, on into early 07 when the surge happened. Um, when you talk about the amount of stuff you were up against on a daily basis, did you think going in it was going to be that high or was it much higher than you expected? Yeah, we stopped over in Spengalum, Germany. I remember we were watching the uh, uh, Armed Forces Network and uh, they were showing footage from Ramadi and it was legit. You know, I mean, it, it was a lot of you know, coordinated attacks, a lot of uh, V bids. Um, you know, right when we got there, there was a big old dump truck that was rolled into, uh, I believe, it was OPVA right on uh, Route Michigan. That was a, uh, a V bid. You know, injured a couple Marines, but uh, fortunately, was dead. It, it, it was intense. Um, we got there, and I think the next day or two days afterwards, a, uh, 
a gentleman was in Camp Ramadi, took a direct mortar hit like a few days before he was leaving country. And, you know, the IEDs and the being a medic, you know, you always gravitate and find yourself working in around the, the cash um, and, and the medical hospital for a lot of these casualties. So it became very real, very quick, but we would, we had been prepared. We, you know, we knew what we were getting into, but I think it's a, it's definitely, it opens your eyes when you see it firsthand. Kevin, we've had some other combat medics on before, you know, and guys who worked in caches and, uh, uh, you know, army hospitals and whatnot. Uh, and you mentioned, you know, everything that goes on when you start to work on people as often as you do over there, does any of it become numb? And is it different for you when it's a SEAL team guy as opposed to somebody else? You know, you always have to be ready. Um, you know, there was a couple times where we were eating mid rats or we were eating chow and, you know, just somebody running like we need litter bearers. Um, and, you know, everybody has a, you know, you, you forget if you're a lieutenant or you're an E6 or an E1, you know, you run to help. Um, and there are a couple of times that we did that and myself and the other uh, H and Delta in, at the team, Johnny Kim, um, you know, would go over there and we'd find ourselves doing more advanced stuff and working at the head of the team. You know, uh, for me personally, I mean, there's always the, you see the casualty, you make the connection. Uh, um, and then immediately for me, you know, there's kind of like that quick little quick shock, you know, gets you, gets your blood moving. And then you realize that like it's work. Um, I wouldn't say you become numb to it. You know, I didn't deal, I, I was not like any of the uh, you know, army medics that work just, just in the cast sites at the surgical centers, uh, in the, the hospitals. Um, so I didn't become numb to it. So but for me, it was simply, all right, this is work. This is the job I have to do. I have to get this, um, you know, I have to get the airway. I have to go ahead and get the IV going. I have to stop this bleed. Um, but that first initial shock, like, hey, this is a fellow service member, I think is the one that always, always, uh, it made it real for me. But when it's a, when it's a team guy, is it different because you're yeah. so personally connected to them? <laughs> yeah. Didn't answer the rest of the question. Um, Man, it's tough. Uh, it, it's tough. You know, I worked on Mark Lee um, and you know, that initial shock because we had just rolled, you know, it was August 2nd, 2006. We had been hitting targets earlier in that morning. Um, you know, Biggles had gotten shot. You know, we all consolidated down. We rejocked, went back out. And Mark and I were in the same Brad. You know, we were knee to knee, you know, rolling out, hitting targets. And then, you know, he followed me into the house. I went upstairs to clear. As I come down, Mark gets shot. You know, that shock was more, uh, it, it stung a lot more because as a medic and having seen it, I knew how final it was. Um, and regardless of what I had done, there wasn't anything I could do that would bring Mark back. And I think that was the hardest thing. It's like, you know, it's like one of those panic things. It's like, uh, I, I don't, I can't even make a great analogy. It's like, you know, you, you have to be somewhere and you're never going to get there and you start getting panicked. And I realized that it didn't matter what I did, I couldn't bring Mark back. And I think for me that, that made me work harder. Um, and then somehow I realized that, you know, Hey, I have to keep working hard because we're still in a firefight. The people around me that are looking at Mark, is he going to make it? And if you don't put forth the effort, it can kill, um, you know, morale for a second, which can be detrimental. So, but for me, it was hard, man. You know, it's hard working on your buddy, somebody that you'd worked with day in and day out for, you know, 18 months, slept in the same tent, you know I mean? Was your shooting buddy. So yeah, it's, it's definitely harder. How much of that incident is with Mark stays with you? I mean, how often does it pop up in your mind? Yeah. Um, you know, I always, always think about Mark. Um, you know, it, it's a, uh, I, I think a lot of people, when they, when they talk about, you know, those things, they, they get down. I was fortunate to live with Mark. Um, you know, he's a, he was a strong person. Um, you know, shoot. I mean, I shared and the rest of the platoon did his final moments with him. Um, and that, and that definitely is empowering. You know, if you're going to go down, you know, being surrounded by a seal platoon guys you worked with, you know, for me, made it all right. And I, I do think about Mark, you know, I think about him daily, um, you know, and I, and I'm proud to serve with him. It's not a, it's not as sore as a, a topic as it was like, you know, the days and the weeks and the months and sure. the, the, other, the yeah. early years, but, but it's a, uh, it's a reminder that, you know, I make every experience last, um, and, and make it as real as possible because the time, the rest of the platoon and I shared with Mark was real. Um, and I'm glad I was able to do that. You know, the job over there, I, I, I asked this question, I have to caveat it because I don't want the non-military folks, you know, to 
think that it's the way we approach combat because it's not. But, you know, what was the best part about chasing down bad guys, kicking down doors and going in houses, you know, with your SEAL team buddies and, and doing the job you were supposed to do? And I, I again, the caveat is that there's no good part of combat, right? But, you know, you, you find ways to really make the experience something that is has value. Yeah. Um, I can't speak for everybody. I think everybody approaches it differently. Um, it's the pursuit. It's the hunt. Um, it doesn't matter. And, and that's something that, you know, now that, that excites me, it's not, it's, it's like in business. It's, it's the hunt, it's the chase, you know, it's, it's getting to the point where you sign the documentation and then what's next. It's the thing that drives Tom Brady to say his favorite Super Bowl is the next one. Um, for us, it was the hunt, the pursuit, you get the bad guy and then, all right, when's the Intel dump coming and when are we going to get our next target package? When is the time to go? And that's, and I think that's the breed that team guys are. It's, it's that constant striving for better for the next one and learning from the last one. Um, and, and for us, it's, it's, you know, it's not, it's not the killing. It's not all that stuff. It's the pursuit. Um, and it's something that, uh, that I can say for me was that constant chase that I enjoyed. As you're finishing up that first deployment and, you know, things are winding down, do you feel the sense of accomplishment that you guys did the job that you were supposed to despite the fact you took losses? Or, you know, is are the losses at the front of this thing? Yeah. Um, I mean, guys were bitter. Um, you know, we're, we're a little bit bitter. I think the way that, uh, you know, at times the platoon was utilized, I think, was – you know, guys are risk. You know, everybody risks something going on deployment. You know, and then you have to look at the risk and see what the reward is. And I think there were times where you know, we were we were utilized in you know at times no different than the army or the marines in presence patrols and FID. But you know, we were finding ourselves in areas where there was no coalition forces, and and at times you know simply you know we had orders to just you know patrol to contact. Um, and, and in an urban environment, you know, when you that's are in the as a military person, that sounds ridiculous on its premise. Patrol to contact. That's not the point of patrolling. Like, you know, I mean, no. <laughs> it's the exact opposite. It, it, exactly. And, and, uh, you know, the, my, the, the commanding officer buds, um, and, you know, the, a lot of the guys I learned from and work up, you know, always talked about the seal advantage, right? So what advantage do you have when you, whether you set up an ambush, you always are, you're always on the attack, right? But we accepted a defensive posture at times, and you know there were jundies that were getting shot on these present patrols. Guys were getting wounded, guys taking you know, uh, you know direct impacts to their helmets and getting knocked out. You know what I mean? Like to that point, and then after Mark was killed and Ryan was injured, um, you know the wind came out of the sails, and there were guys that were bitter. And I think the nail. Um, you know, the straw that broke the camel's back was, was Mike Monsor. Um, you know, Mike was, was a fellow new guy, um, you know, was killed in September about shoot a week and a half, uh, two weeks before I rotated out. Um, and it was one of those, it's a turnover op, you know, you're just going out there to show the next team how it's done. Um, but you know, warning order got passed up, you know, mission got approved and they found themselves out farther than they should and there was no no medic on board and that was the one that broke the camel's back it was like are we being utilized like we should be um and what what are the ramifications of that so when i look back now at the accomplishments and i do meet people i I spend a lot of time you know speaking doing that sort of thing i run to people and you know the results are palpable i mean there, there are people who say that you know appreciate what you guys did and I'm quick to point out that it wasn't just the SEAL platoon. You know, it was the Marines, the 3638 Marines, you know, the Army cats that we worked with that, that got the job done. It was the air cover from the Air Force. Uh, it was a true combined effort. But I think in the, in the time that we were there, you know, there really wasn't that reflection, um, I think, that uh, from a lot of us. What happened to Mike, the actual events, I mean? Uh, Mike was on the rooftop and, uh, one of the insurgents threw a grenade up on the roof and Mike jumped on the grenade, absorbed the majority of the blast, um, and then earned the medal of honor and the rest of the seals and, and Jundies were able to walk away from that rooftop. Mike did not. Wow. Where were you when it happened? I was, uh, you know, our, our Charlie platoon and Mike was in Delta platoon, our Charlie platoon 
and uh, the other half of his platoon was back at Camp Ramadi, now okay. uh, Camp Mark Lee, and we were packing up. Uh, I was actually just waking up um, when we got the uh, got the news that Mike was being uh, Kazavak to, uh, I believe, is Camp Ramadi, um, and they were you know doing CPR CPR on him on the way. When you hear that. That, that you know, he he jumped on a grenade. Uh, you know, I, I I feel like anybody would have done it, right? Anybody in uniform would have should have done it. Um, that would have been a natural reaction for a lot of people. But um, when, when you're kind of confronted with that moment and you and you have to decide on your own mortality, it's obviously a little bit more different. And that said, uh, what does it surprise you at all that Mike did that? No, not at all. Um, you know, you say that, and I, I've seen people run away from from the, from sure. contact. Yeah. Some people run away, you know, people that, you know, kind of, it, it kind of, you don't expect it from. Um, but that's where I go back and I say that, you know, I saw a lot of bravery in the teams, uh, a lot of heroics in the teams that, you know, those individuals would never actually admit it and say, I'm a hero. Um, but I saw some tough dudes and people always, there's a debate like are seals made or born. Um, I truly believe that you are born with the ability to do that job and that you find that job because it's available. And that's why large amount of team guys or green Braves or Rangers are tough dudes. Um, so when presented with that decision, it's a split second decision. You know, it's not something you do a, you know, pro con list and then decide it's an instinctual thing. And for Mike, it happened so fast. Instinctually, he knew that he had to do something and what he did was not something that was, um, you think about, you just do it. And that's where, uh, you know, I, I say that that's true heroics. So you finished that first deployment and you talked a little bit about the, for lack of a better term, bitterness uh, of the way things had went down. When you have to go back in 2008, what are your feelings and thoughts at that point? I, I mean, bitter, you know, it, bitterness in that, you know, Mark, Mark was a new guy with me. Um, Big Olds was a new guy. Mike was a new guy. And, you know, you get the shit kicked out of you when you're a new guy, like all the time, you know, sure. you get the shit jobs and then you look back and you're like, well, these fucking new guys are laying it down, man. These new guys are taking risks. And, and, you know, for a minute, you know, you do get a little bit bitter. Um, but fortunately you come back, you drink a couple beers, you know, you relax. And then you look at, you know, the guys you have with, and, and I worked with Chris, Chris was in our platoon and, and Charlie platoon that go around. And then, Going back to Iraq in 2008, Chris was going to be my LPO, leading petty officer, and I was supposed to, I was supposed to go to a different SEAL platoon and then deploy to you know Asia. But Chris was like, "Hey, I need a medic. Do you want to go?" And it was uh, one of those things I didn't think about. It was like, "Well, of course, yeah." Um, so going back, we had a solid group, um, solid team guys, and, and that's what made it uh, much better. But the mission wasn't there. You know, the mission had moved. Uh, it wasn't out in Western Iraq where we had been the first time so the deployment wasn't the same i don't want to turn the you know attention to chris but i'm sure the audience is just curious day-to-day uh, -day life with him what was it like well this is where the movies get it all wrong um, <laughs> i, I mean, was gonna yeah. get to that part because you well let me tell everybody you had an actual role in the making of american sniper as a, a you know support staff correct Correct. Yeah. I worked as a technical advisor, also acted in the movie. Uh, but it was a movie made without Chris. Um, you know, Chris wasn't there, obviously, for the filming. Uh, he was there partially for the writing, but the story changed after he was murdered. Um, so the movie missed what, you know, in a lot of ways, what Chris is like day to day personality. Chris was a funny guy. He was a, a he was a he would love to, you know, prank people. His thing was antiquing. And if you watch, um, what was that? Uh, CKY and you know Jackass and stuff like that. You know they would you 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 knock on somebody's you know door in the middle of the night. They're getting out of their rack and you'd have a handful of flour in a in a coffee filter and you'd hit them in the face with with that. And that was Chris's thing, man. He loved to antique people. You could hear him <laughs> one. You you would never hear the knock, but you'd always hear him cackling and running away. And that was his thing. He loved antiquing. Um, you know he he loved pranking. We you know we had one individual in the platoon who. You know, and weight wise really wasn't up to standards. And Chris was a big proponent of giving him a hard time. And he'd encourage you, hey, find that Otis Spunkmeyer muffin, cut in half, leave the muffin top on that dude's seat so he gets the point. You know, he was kind of like that guy. Um, always down for a good joke, poking fun at people. Um, and 
Chris was fun to work with. He was one of those dudes who had your back. And I think that was a big thing with lower enlisted. You know, if you had an issue, you could rely on Chris to speak up on your behalf. What kind of relationship did you have with him? We had a close relationship. Um, you know, I, like I said, I went through sniper school and then when I got to, came back to the platoon, you know, we started work up and, you know, I was one of the new snipers in addition to Johnny Kim, who's the other medic. And I mentioned Johnny quite a bit. He's, uh, he's been in the news recently. He's the, you know, the SEAL medic went on to Harvard, became an MD and then got picked up for the astronaut program. So if you're ever sitting around wondering like, what have you done with your life? Clearly we have done nothing compared to Johnny Kim. (laughs) Uh, Yeah. Harvard astronaut. Yeah. I mean, these are everyday things that most people do. Basically a unicorn. Uh, yeah, (laughs) but yeah, so no, but we had a close relationship and Chris was, uh, you know, really got involved with, with the new guys. You know, he had a, he had a soft spot. And if you, if you ever meet his brother, Jeff, you know, uh, I don't think Chris had the same soft spot for Jeff. Cause every story I talk with Jeff, he's always, Chris is always him, him and Chris are always fighting. Um, but you know, Chris was like that with us, but at the same time it was that, Hey, the learning curve is steep. And he was one of the few guys in the platoon that spent his time working with, um, with the Marines in the 04, uh, push into Fallujah. So he understood, you know, what it was like to be there and why we should be squared away when we get there. Um, and then that relationship grew into uh, my second deployment in 08 with Chris. And there weren't too many guys from our old platoon, so Chris and I stuck together. And then that relationship continued. I was got out of the Navy in, uh, in 2010. I was looking for work as I was finishing school. And, you know, he brought me on board with his company, Kraft, where, you know, I was working at night, working for his company. So that relationship was, it was tight, you know, despite the fact I'm from Connecticut and he was from Texas. One more and, and we can move on because you did, obviously your, your Navy career ends as you get out of the Navy and Chris does the same. Um, but, you know, two part question here. Um, one, what was it like for you hearing about his murder? And secondly, you know, how much of you really wanted to be part of the film to at least provide some truth and accuracy. Because look, I promised myself, I would. I read the book before I watched the movie. I always do that. If I'm interested in a story and there's a book out, I'll always read the book first before I ever watch the movie. And, um, you know, like I felt like Lone Survivor was Hollywood crap as far as the movie was mm-hmm. concerned compared to the book because it just didn't even do it justice. Um, that said, I really felt like more of the movie was meant to tie you emotionally to Chris than be factually accurate as far as, you know, uh, who he was and, and how things went in combat and everything else, because, well, Hollywood wants to draw the emotion out of you. I get that. So kind of just tell me about, you know, again, hearing about his murder and where were you and, and then being part of that film. Yeah. So, yeah, I'd gotten out in 2010 and then finished my undergrad at UConn and then went to Wake Forest and Winston-Salem. And I was out at a birthday party at this bar. Um, my wife and I, and my phone rang and it was, um, you know, the guy we worked with, Stephen Young at Kraft. And you know, he called me. I was like, what's he calling me on a Saturday for? So I step outside and he, he's like, do you hear the news? And I'm like, I have no idea what you're talking about. He's like, Chris is murdered. And it was like, you lost cabin pressure. Um, it didn't, it didn't sink in. Um, it didn't, it didn't seem real. Um, yeah, I told my wife who's really close, uh, to, you know, she, she'd known Chris for a while. Um, it wasn't real until I went to Dallas and, um, right before the funeral and there was a, you know, we, we had a wake and, a, and it was an open casket. And I, I remember, that's when it sunk in. But I was always waiting for the Chris to just come out and, you know, typical jokes are like, you just got punked. You know, Chris and Ashton Kutcher are like, come out around the corner. Um, but it wasn't real until until I saw him. And because, uh, you know, Chris, Chris it has, in, in Baghdad in 08, you know, Chris, same thing, took a, took a round right off the forehead on his helmet, knocked his helmet off. So, you know, Chris had had some close calls before, but that just seems it, – it was too much to, to – to, I couldn't believe it. I really couldn't believe it. And there were times that, like, even the years, I couldn't believe it because um, I'd never had a friend murdered before. You know, sure. I'd lost guys in combat and that, and that – but I'd never had a friend who was murdered. And for me, that was – you know, it was definitely uh, a sobering moment. Um, but when we had worked on the process of, of making the movie – I had linked up with Jason Hall, who's the screenwriter. Right. And he, he was plugging myself and Chris and getting the technical details of how a SEAL platoon would do X, Y, and Z um, in order to create this screenplay for American Sniper, the movie. And American Sniper, the movie, prior to Chris being murdered, was totally different than the American Sniper you have now, um, which was going to be focused more so on the technical component. There wasn't this dramatic, you know, 
character, you know, s- cycle and saga and all that. Right. So two part with Chris not being there, it became an emotional connection with the story. It was sure. let's develop this character, you know, and then let it be a biopic in some ways. But then bring in Clint on, and Clint's awesome, but he's a drama guy, um, you know, and he wanted it to be dramatic. He didn't. He wasn't looking for a, you know, a true war story. There's a war component, but it was a, you know, it was a biopic um, of Chris's life, and that's where you get the 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 dramatics in there versus a factual day by day. This is how things were done because I didn't go through buds with Chris, you know. Neither did um, not Mark Lee was a new guy with me, so you know it wasn't like we rolled up as new guys and Mark Lee was there. So you lose that, and then I realize, and you know, there's only so much you can do as a support cast as a technical advisor. But ultimately, I think the takeaways are, you know, people look at that and they're like. I see where this is going. You know, this is a great representation of Chris and what other military families go through in times of war. Yeah. And, you know, as I said, and as you just reiterated, it, it, Hollywood needs the emotional aspect. Furthermore, because by the time American Sniper came around, there had been at least a dozen, if not two dozen war movies that were made. Right. Like the war on terror movies are our parents' westerns. You know, they made like 500 West. John Wayne did like 500 westerns in the 60s, 50s, 60s and 70s. Well, war movies are, are, are the western of our parents generation there were so many of them so you had to find a different angle to make the story worthwhile telling otherwise you're just telling the same combat story over and over again for the general public who doesn't understand the difference you and i understand the difference because we've been through it and we we see the nuance and how important it is but to the general public who's never put on a uniform they can't figure that out so uh again i thought the movie was good but I knew there was stuff missing. Uh, and shameless plug here, we did actually interview Chris's wife, Taya Kyle, on a previous episode of the Hazard Ground Podcast. You can go back and listen to it. She's an amazing woman. Such grace, Kevin. I mean, just such strength, and, and she really conducts herself well. And, you know, throughout the whole interview with her, you can hear her voice crack, and obviously it's, you know, understandably still emotional for her all these years later. But beyond that, I mean, she... uh you know, she's a picture of, of just somebody who um, possesses that it, that inner fortitude to keep going on. Yeah, man. And and, and, and back to your point about the, the movies, uh, I think it goes back to A Few Good Men and, and the Jack Nicholson. I don't think people can handle the truth. Uh, <laughs> if, if you were to tell them exactly how combat is, and I think you get a touch of that with Ridley Scott's uh, Black, Black Hawk, Hawk Down. Down. That- Brother, you, it's the only movie that I really think does combat right. It is, but it's it's a point. It's it's one long op, um, and I think what scares people is, and I think that's what scares people about some people in the military is like there are gentlemen and women who have been doing sustained combat for eighteen years now. You know what I mean? Yep. Like before nine eleven and now, and it it scares them that like there are humans amongst us that can do this job for that long against a you know an, an, an enemy that won't back down. And I think if you were to tell them specifically how it's done, I think it would scare them. I, I don't think, I don't think the public's ready for it, a true representation of, of 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 the type of individual that's able to do that for so many years. All right, good. Uh, thank you for sharing all that about Chris. Obviously, again, not not germane to your life and your story, um, but you know, I certainly appreciate you doing it. So you make the decision to get out of the Navy. Why? Well, you know, I joined the Navy for, uh, you know, like I said, for one main reason. Uh, right after nine eleven wanted to go ahead and, and do my part, uh, wanted to get after it. You know, it, there was definitely the allure of combat. Um, that's why I went to the Marine Corps first, but they were not there. So I walked in the Navy office, got involved with a recruiter poster I was in. Um, and I had a fantastic, and, and don't get me wrong, you know, we, we, we said bitter, but I had a fantastic deployment in 2006, you know, wanted to go to combat, wanted to shoot, wanted to do, move, move, communicate, all that stuff. Did it. Next deployment was, you know, it was a good deployment and I felt complete. There was, I realized it wasn't going to get any better than what we did in 2006. And now that I stand back, you know, 12 years later and talk to guys who are still in, it will never be that good. You know, it was one of those, the stars aligned. It was a great time to be in the military, great time in the, you know, really the nascent stages of special operations in the, in the GWAT. So it was never going to be that good. Um, it's changed. Guys are still, still doing great things, but you know, you're not going to go and, and shoot 230, you know, uh, insurgents in a six month period. It's just not going to happen sure. um, unless you're dropping, you know, massive ordnance in some of these other areas. But, you know, if it's long range target interdiction, you're just not going to do it. So 
I realized I'd done all this stuff and got to experience this and be with such a great team, great platoon, great troop that it was time to move on. Um, and for me, getting out, going back to school was, you know, coming back full circle, getting my degree. And I wanted to stay in medicine. Becoming a PA was that next step because I got to work with PAs, saw what they did, was really interested. You know, I like the fact that it was expedited, didn't have to go to medical school and then do residency and fellowship. So I liked what PAs did and I really liked Wake Forest. Um, and that was the path for me. You know, you mentioned the difference. I went back in 2011 to Iraq and I can't tell you how frustrating that whole deployment was because we went there to leave. And in the same respect yeah. that sitting there, we sat there for a year going, okay, we're leaving. What, what the hell are we doing? Like, we have right. no goal here other than to leave. Then let's just pick up our shit and go. Like, how long can we actually just sit here until we have to leave? And we literally sat there for a year. And um, it, it sort of takes something away from the other experience you had in a sense. It doesn't affect it per se. Like, my first deployment on 506, even to this point, you know, nearly 20 years uh, of a military career, it was the best 15 months of my, my life. It was the best 15 months yeah. of my career and nothing will ever change that. But when I think about that second one, I sit there and I go, man, I mean, you, you literally wasted a year of my life. Mm -hmm. So I certainly understand that. Talking about powerful experiences from that time, for me, it was coming back from my last deployment in OA with a good good friend of, my, friend of mine, Guy. He was the lieutenant in our platoon and we flew back early, like a couple weeks early um, I was processing out and, you know, I remember being, uh, you know, being greeted in Baltimore, BWI, you know, we, t we tagged along to an army unit that had been deployed for like 13 months. Um, and we tagged along on the back of the train and they had, you know, World War II vets, Korean War vets, Vietnam vets, you know, Desert Storm vets, all welcoming families and all this stuff. And the Vietnam vets were the ones that were like crying. And I remember like walking through the line, me and Guy were just trying to like, you know, just Stay, stay, be the gray people in the back of the train. Um, and I remember them crying. I remember saying to guys like, man, dude, I hope that's not us. Meaning like, I hope what we did doesn't get turned into kind of what, what Vietnam was. You know, you go ahead and fight for something and then relinquish it. And, and coming back and seeing, you know, and hearing stories like what you say of, of you know, getting ready to leave, it, it would leave me very, very bitter to go back to Ramadi and see that, you know, turned over all the ground we fought for. Um, cause it was hard, hard fought ground and to turn it back over would be, uh, for me to go back and see that would be very, very bitter. You know, it's, you know, it's interesting, uh, you know, I'm coming up on 20 years and just a, a quick personal story. You know, it finally dawned on me when it, you hit 20 years, like not that I have any intention of getting out or the army has any intention of getting rid of me in the, in the immediate future. But part of me starts to realize I'll never do this again. And, and with mm. that. It's, there's a part of me that really wants to deploy again, like somewhere, anywhere. Like I just kind of want one more rush. And as crazy as it sounds, my life is dramatically different. I have little ones, you know, and, and there's a whole but there's a whole different set of risks on the line uh, by deploying this time around. But there's there's still a weird part of me on right on the inside in my core that goes, man, I want one more run at this thing. Like I really want one more run because I'll never be able to do it again. Yeah, I'm telling you, it's the pursuit, man. It's the pursuit. And that's what that's what drives individuals. That's uh, that's what fires us up, and that's what fires people like you up, no, no doubt. All right, so you come, become a PA, um, and you start doing professional speaking as well. Uh, your charity, um, your books. Tell me about how those come about. Yeah, so uh, you know, we, we came out with our book. Um, shoot, that was 2016, I think it came out. Um, yeah, so we came out the last Punisher. Uh, we did a memoir on. Uh, the deployment. I wanted to focus just on the Iraq deployment in 06 and just talk about that um, and, and, and basically describe how a, a new guy, a new platoon member goes and, and has those experiences and kind of like that mental component because a lot of books are good at talking about the play-by-play, -play, but what, what do you feel and what goes through your brain when you engage a target? Um, and that's what we want to capture in addition to show – every aspect of the platoon. I mean, you know, you watch some of these movies and you think one person runs everything and that's not the case. And we want to capture with the last Punisher. So you know, we had a lot of, we're publishing a bunch of language. We're actually coming out in Polish. Um, and this week actually. Um, so we've been, ha we've had a great run with that. Um, and actually Lindsay and I, and Bill Hobbs just came out with the veterans workbook, um, which will be coming out shortly. And I think I just sent you the, uh, the cover for that. And sure. we got that idea. Because getting out of the, it's the veterans workbook, you know, how to transition out of the military and get hired. Because getting out of the military, you know, they give you the, they give you the TAPS class. You know, they give you that one week. This is how to do a resume. Um, this is how to, you know, talk to the VA and good luck. 
And I didn't find that very, very helpful at all. You know, I found myself doing a lot of work um, behind the scenes, you know, a lot of stuff on my own. And there's nothing wrong with that. I truly believe believe you need to pull yourself up by your bootstraps. But there were things that lessons learned I wish I had known and I wish somebody had told me. So we wrote the Veterans Workbook, How to Transition Out of the Military and Get Hired as as a you know an addendum to the TAPS class and show people this is what you could be doing in the meantime. Um, so we're pretty excited about that. We'll be out here shortly. And the last Punisher, um, you know, New York Times bestseller. Uh, and I love the way the angle you took at it because I think that to me, I always talk in the podcast about the human condition in combat because nothing on this earth matches it. There, There is nothing in the world that compares to what goes on to your mind and your body in combat. And we've talked about this repeatedly. Whether you come back alive and unscathed or not, Part of who you are dies on the battlefield, and that it comes from the idea that you, no matter what, will be different than when you got back. And what you're leaving on the battlefield, you can never take back with you. You're a different person now, Kevin, than you were before the first time you ever deployed. doesn't matter what sort of training you went through in BUDS or combat medic school. I think you would agree that when you came home from that first deployment, you knew you were a different person. I agree. I agree. You know, and, and I think... Um I think a lot of, and you bring up a very valid point. You know, I think my, my tolerance for BS is, it was lost out there. Um, but I think you gain a lot of stuff and, um, you know, some of the things that I experienced over there and a lot of other people did, you know, especially August 2nd with Mark and, and Biggles and, and that thing, you gain a lot because you're given an experience. And I think that's the, the biggest takeaway I had with Mark. And, you know, I don't think he, he, he had any intentions of sharing that, you know, from Mark, it would have been, you know, God created that moment, but, you know, to, to be there and work on Mark, um, in those final moments are experiences that not many people on earth have. Um, and for, for myself, you know, it was, I think it was a strengthening moment. You know, it was the worst moment of my life, but at the same time, you know, definitely found, you know, power to do that work, um, and do the best I can and have an experience that I was able to share you know, intimately with Mark. Um, and that was my takeaway. And I think there are a lot of experiences you share that are empowering that others may seem as a negative. And don't get me wrong, losing Mark is, a, is probably one of the worst things I've ever experienced, if not the worst. Um, but I was fortunate. And Mark was a man of God. And I think to experience that moment with him um, was something that he would want me to take away from it. So I gained a lot in that deployment, as did lose, lost some. Powerful stuff. Uh, hunting for Healing, your charity. What's it about? How'd you come up with it? Man, I wish I could say I came up with it, um, but it was my beautiful wife, Lindsay, who came <laughs> up with that. Um, she's the, if you don't know, she's the brains of the operation. Um, you know, I may be the, the CEO, but she's the XO because everybody knows the XO really gets stuff done. Um, so anyway, yeah. So in, in, in uh, 2015, I took my wife to Africa. Like I said, I love to hunt, love to chase big game. Um, I've been going to Africa before. And my second time, I was like, you know, I want to bring my wife. It's aesthetically beautiful. You know, I think she'd love it. She grew up in a hunting family. She did not hunt. Um, and I took her out there and she did, she actually hunted with me, um, and loved it. But the part that she loved the most was the fact that we were able to get away, you know, turn off the cell phones, the computers and, and really connect and just enjoy each other and out there in Africa and nature and all that. So we came back and she formed hunting for healing, which is a 501 C three out of Florida, um, where we take injured veterans and their spouses on hunting, fishing, outdoor activities as a, as a way to, expand that communication process. Um, we've been very successful. We've taken groups back to Africa. We go back to Costa Rica. Uh, we fish quite a bit. We hunt quite a bit. Um, and we can't do that without the support of uh, obviously other veterans, but also a lot of us civilians who want to get involved and really create those memorable experiences for veterans because these, are, these civilians are patriots that maybe didn't have the opportunity to join the military, went into other things, um, but they're very supportive of the military and we're able to do hunting for healing because of their support. You look back on your military career, um, you know, in totality, what stays with you? What's the best part about it? Um, wh wh what do you still hold on to? Man, people ask me, would I, would I have done anything differently? And I look at it, I'm like, man, maybe I would have gone to college first. Going back to college with kids was tougher. Um, I wouldn't change anything. You know, I think uh, I definitely took out as much as I put in. I think there were aspects that I could have taken out more. The experiences I had, you know, I wouldn't. I wouldn't trade them for anything. There's no college experience I could have had that would have given me the experiences that I had in the military, the friendships, the true friendships. And I think, Mark, you would agree that there are friends you have and then there are friends you have in the military um, that really test all components of being a friend. You know, there are times you, where you, where you 
love somebody to death and you hate them at the same time. Um, but you ultimately put the mission first and that's what comes for. And I developed relationships that, uh, that are stronger than just about anything. Um, I look back at, uh, what I learned about for myself. You know, there were times where, you know, growing up, I thought I was the baddest dude on the planet. And I went to buds and realized that there's 30 other bad dudes here and, you know, they're probably tougher than me, but we were able to go through situations that tested all of us. So I learned quite a bit about myself, not only training, but also combat. Um, but I realized that, through it all, man, the, the biggest takeaway for me was, you know, and you mentioned it early on about, you know, working on teammates and being in combat. Like I've definitely learned to engage as much as possible, get the experience as much as possible. Um, because what you go through and what you do, you don't know when it could end. Um, and for me, that was the biggest takeaway to really, you know, live your life with the people you love the most, um, and enjoy that because I was fortunate to do that with Mark with his time on the planet and with Biggles and Mike Monsoor, but you know, everybody's time comes and you better engage and you better take as much and give as much as you can because it's pretty fleeting. When you do your public speaking, what's the kind of core of each speech or does it depend on the audience? Um, I, you know, I have a, a general theme, but it's, it's really tailored. Um, but I, I talk about one theme, um, th- that the most that people really, they really ask for it's um, they want to know about teamwork and leadership at every level. Um, and I talk about those, but I really believe there's one key line. And the thing that I learned about being on a team um, is that it doesn't matter where you find yourself on a team, um, you know, in your work team, your, your home family team, you know, church group doesn't matter, but the most dangerous position you can be on that tank that on that team is replaceable. Um, so the goal in all these teams is to become irreplaceable. So, you know, I tie in, you know, being a team guy and what I learned at Bud's about getting outside of your comfort zone. You know, you can't live unless you get outside your comfort zone, you know, owning your space and taking full responsibility for everything you do. Um, And the teams, we talk about uh, leadership at every level. doesn't matter if you're a new guy or the most senior guy, you have to be able to stand up and lead complacency, complacency killing. And then finally, you know, earning your trident every day. So putting forth the effort to say, you're a team guy and you should be a team guy each and every day and everything that you do. Um, in order to do all those, you know, when you do all those, you become an irreplaceable member of your team. Kevin, look, the books, The Last Punisher, The Veterans Workbook, uh, The Charity, uh, uh, Hunting for Healing, and, and everything that you've done and accomplished, and obviously your work with American Sniper will kind of be uh, memorialized forever. Uh, and, and to that end, certainly uh, your name, even though, as you said, it's not as famous as some of the other guys, the work that you've done <laughs> certainly uh, holds true for for all of time. And look, brother, I mean, I, I, I kind of just love your story and everything that you've been able to go through and accomplish. And uh, I certainly thank you for speaking with us. But, you know, really, I, I hope you continue to do the work that you're doing and, and continue to change and enrich lives, not only for veterans, but everybody around you. And uh, it's just been a pleasure speaking with you, brother. I appreciate it, man. I appreciate your service. And I'm glad we're able to to kick the same dirt out there in Iraq. And uh, I wish you all the best in the future and uh, keep bringing on some great guests. Kevin Lace, thanks for being part of the Hazard Ground. Thank you, man. Take care. You've been listening to the Hazard Ground Podcast, hosted by Mark Zeno and produced by Matt Pascarella. If you have an interesting story to tell and you'd like to be on the show, send us an email at hazardgroundpodcast at gmail.com. And if you like the show, don't forget to subscribe, rate, and review on iTunes. Thanks for listening. We'll see you next time.